Welcome to the Modern Biopharma Podcast. The world of today's medicines is big, complex, and constantly changing. Our goal is to give you insight into the people that are manufacturing the medicines people need every day. Whether it is the people taking care of these facilities, or those building them, or those maintaining the quality and integrity of every dose that is delivered to the patient, we interview the people that are making it happen and give you a chance to get to know them while we're at it. Thanks for saying hi. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Modern Biopharma podcast. We are excited to have on today Eric Bosenhart of IPS down in North Carolina. Eric, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I am doing well. Another beautiful day as our summertime starts to approach. Since we're locked down, that's kind of nice. I hear the weather is very nice down by you. Oh, yeah. It's been great the last few weeks. Yes, the perfect exactly. weather. North Carolina, perfect weather. I guess San Diego may be a little bit better, but. Um, yeah, yeah, they're the only, they're the only guys who, uh, who really compete with us. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, we're excited to have you on today. So for, for everybody that's listening, Eric is um, the bio, a bioprocess SME at IPS down in North Carolina. Um, and Eric, uh, the reason I reached out to Eric to have him on today is Eric is um, doing his own podcast, and he works um, on his podcast with his dad. Your dad is Herman, correct? Yep. Does he go by Herman? Yeah, he goes by Herman. All right. Um, Occasionally, he'll go by the Hermanator, but that's a whole other story. The Herminator. All right. Is there an Ericator? That doesn't work. No, Um, no, no. All right. Um, So I reached out to them because they're doing their own podcast, which I thought was really neat, Um, and they've listened to a couple episodes. You've done two episodes so far? Uh, yeah, we've released two episodes so far. There's there's more in the works that I've already been reported and will be coming out over the, the you know rest of the year. Right. Well, it's uh, they were good. I I'm I'm out of my depth listening to some of them, but they were very good. And what I thought was really neat about Eric and his dad was that a, a couple things. First off, they're writing these articles, um, getting you know sort of published on different um, venues, but they're just like, helpful articles. It's not a white paper. It's not this you know, huge, long study that, you know, everybody waits four years to publish. They're really just putting stuff out there um, based on the stuff they see day to day. And I just, I really appreciate that way of looking at things. I think in our very scientific world that you operate in, that's maybe not the norm, but I think it's, it's pretty good. So I appreciate that. And the other thing is that you're doing it with your dad. So that's super, how, how is doing this kind of thing with your dad? What is that like? Uh, well, to me, it's 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 great. It feels like such a fulfillment of uh, of what I was brought up. Because I, I mean, I heard about the business all through all through my youth. I actually got you know go to do my first uh, tour of a biotech facility when I was sixteen, um, and taking part in trade shows even before I graduated. So I've always felt part of the industry. And so going through this with my dad, getting to the same level where we're working together on um, trying to advance the industry, like you pointed out, just, just answering quite people's questions of more of the, the hows and the whats of, of how, how do I actually do this? We write a lot of white papers. You know, I, I'm, I work with ISP and writing good practice guys. But, you know, sometimes we have, to, we have to make things very general, very broad. And, you know, by doing our own thing with the articles, we could say, well, here's a way of doing it. Yeah, I think, I think you're right on there because there's, you know, again, ISPE writes guidelines and everything, how you're supposed to do everything. But it's so, it's so all-encompassing. Sometimes it's hard to, to you want to you wanna have your specific situation, right? And yeah. they don't exist. There's, they aren't there. But what you do is you get to see a bunch of specific situations and then you can down to maybe where you're at and what you're doing. And I just, I really think it's, uh, that's great that you've been able to do that. So, um, so I, we chatted a little bit before, but one of the things, you know, I'm interested in, um, in our world, especially for the, there's a whole younger group of engineers coming up right now. I don't know how young you are, but you're younger than me. I can tell. <laughs> um, so, and you were able to see a lot of this before you went off to college because your dad, so that's pretty neat. So, you know, what, what sort of drew you into the industry besides the fact that your dad was in the business? Well, I, I, I really do. I, I have that, that knack, you know, we'll go back to like the you know, Dilbert cartoon of, 
Yeah. Likes, likes to really mess with things, put, take things apart, put them back together, see how they function. Uh, so I always, always knew I was going to be an engineer of some sort. And then along the way, looking at, at different fields, different applications, um, you know, chemistry, biology, the intersection of those just seemed like such a, an interesting and an emerging field. Uh, you know, there's traditional chemical engineering. It's, it's, you know, it can be, it can be pretty exciting. But when I get to deal with the, the you know, biological aspect of it, growing cells, DNA manipulation, there's just a whole level of understanding that we're lacking and that we're gaining. Um, the last five, maybe ten years, you know, the, the, our understanding of the immune system and our methods of modifying it through gene therapies, mRNAs. It's just completely changed. Mm. Yeah, I, and you're you're right in the uh, the thick of that world um, down there in the yeah. RTP area, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a pretty exciting space to be in. Um, well, all right. So what we're going to talk about today that was a, a, a awesome segue. Um, what we're going to talk about today is one of your um, articles that you wrote with your dad, and um, I'm. I'm I read it, it was really good. Um, and what, I, like we talked about before, very specific, like here's an example specifically of what was done, how it could have been done better, what was done wrong. And uh, just very helpful for those that are out there. And um, the article, we'll, we'll link to it after the show or, or on the show notes so that people can, can get to it. But it's called, what, you call that a RABS? And um, it's a bunch of um, situations that you guys have encountered, seen, and you know, found as problems fixed. I don't, I don't know all the outcomes of some of these, but some things that you've seen, and uh, hopefully more of them were fixed than were left. But you know, um, so we're going to talk through some of that today, and um, hopefully people can learn a little bit more about what's what's the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things from your examples. So. Um, if we could first, just so we're, we're all starting the same footing. And like I said, I'm out of my depth a little bit on, on some of these things, but right. let's just start with what is a RABS? Ah, uh, okay. Let's, let's start let's nice go. and easy. Well, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, so, so we'll start off with, with more of the textbook definition. And, and this is, this is, again, this is where, you know, the ISP guidelines and, and some of the other, you know, general guidance out there do a really good job. They actually have, Hey, this is the definition, you know, restricted access barrier system. All right, great, perfect. That's pretty succinct. Now, then we start going down through the different types of RABS. Again, you know, between ISB guides and other published stuff, it talks about what's an active RABS, where the this restrictive access barrier has its own um, HVAC and, and, and HEPA system uh, versus a passive system, which uses the room system, the, the room ceiling HEPAs. Um, and then it also goes into define um, to some you know different levels of detail. What's a, what's an open RABS where that air that's getting pushed out you know out of the RABS gets circulated back to the room and then gets picked back up, or whether it's a closed RABS, which is merely an isolator, where because we're trying to recirc the air coming out of the RABS, but we're not quite sealed to the level where we'd have an isolator. So what, uh, can we differentiate between isolator and RABS then? Because isolator, yeah. everybody knows what an isolate, isolator is, is. It's been around a long time, right? Versus RABS yep. hasn't been around quite as long. So what's the difference? Well, between... Actually, it's the other way. I think it's the other way around. RAB, RABS have been around for longer than isolators. Really? But the, okay. challenge, has been, but the <laughs> challenge has been, what do we, what do we, what is a RABS? You okay. know, for, for a long time, we had the, the plastic curtains up. And was that real? Is that really a RABS? Depends who you ask. Some people would say, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's our RABS system," and they're pointing at a plastic curtain hang hanging from the ceiling. But that's not really. It's not really restricting anything. It's, mm -hmm. it's a plastic curtain. It's stopping um, people from walking in, basically. <laughs> not even stopping people from walking in. They're reaching in. They're doing stuff. Um, you're still having all sorts of airflow issues around it. You're still having difficulty cleaning it. Stuff is still shedding off of it. It's a mess, but it's a barrier of some sort. And those have been around for, for ages. Um, the isolators are, are, are a little more recent invention. Uh, and 
you know, a, a little long, taking a little longer for the industry to accept. Though we, I think we're getting there. We're, we're finally crossed the spot where um, m over 50% of the new lines are getting isolators as opposed to rabs, uh, fill lines, that is. Mm -hmm. uh, but the isolator is basically, it's, it looks, it's a glove box. It's, it's something that's completely sealed. You know, there's maybe a small amount of leakage, but it's something that I can go, I can pressurize and I can measure the leak rate. And I can hold the pressure in it. Rabs, I can't do that. It's just going to leak out. It's going to leak like a sieve. Uh, I'll never be able to pressurize the, the thing, even in the closed rabs. Okay. And ultimately the reason we have rabs um, is, can, can you just sort of talk through why we have a, why we have them or an isolator um, as the case may be? Yeah, no, this, this, all, this all is coming out of how do we protect the product? Uh, you know, we're, we're, there's a lot of stuff going on in the room uh, between the equipment, between the operators, and we, we want to keep particulates, both viables and non-viables, out of the, the open product. So again, traditionally, you see this on fill lines, I got an open vial just going along. I don't want anything falling in it. Then I'm going to get injected with later. So that, you know, we, we talk about, you know, we hear about grade A spaces or ISO 5 in the particulate counts. That's, you know, some of the things we're, we, we were, we're trying to get. And what these are, these are engineering controls to ensure that we have those level of, of cleanliness, you know, that we are meeting the grade A for, uh, both particulate and microbial. Same thing in the ice, in the, in the FDA ISO 5 standard. You know, we're meeting those requirements so that we don't ship out at any vials that have stuff in them that's either going to grow or that's going to injure somebody when they get injected with it. Mm. Good. Okay, so you have in there article, you had seven examples. We're not going to go through all seven. We'll maybe hit a couple here. Um, and you have, you have the first one was, whoops, I forgot the glove, the glove ports. Um, Let's save some money and use the wall. Acrylic panels are cheap, but glove ports cost money. You got you got a whole bunch here that are that are pretty interesting. And uh, you know, one thing that seems uh, pretty evident to me, unless I miss something, is most of them, if not all of them, are situations where they're they're retrofits. They're not yeah. original, right? It's not like it's a, a you know a ground up design with that all in mind in the beginning. So. Um, Want to talk me through one of these that you think uh, that maybe is your personal experience that, that you really um, thought was a good learning experience? Well, one, one of my favorites is um, the, uh, the one where it's a little further down uh, where curtains are barriers too. And, you know, but it was, you know, I had the, you know, quotes around it of 2017. Is people think, oh, well, we stopped using plastic curtains many years ago. Well, this was only a few years ago that we went into a facility and, uh, you know, they had been in trouble with the FDA for some of their, their products. And uh, this, they had plastic curtains. And what were the plastic curtains there for? What were they really doing? Um, nothing. They were actually creating issues. So in that particular facility, the curtains separated different zones within the room. So on one side was your ISO 5, and the other side was going to be your, your ISO 7. So basically, they went from a grade C or B, depending upon what they were saying at the time, to a, a grade A zone. However, there's a lot of lessons learned to be here on this one. Is they had people on the other side of those curtains. It wasn't like just sticking their hands in. It was they'd walk through the curtains. Mm. <laughs> and so now you, you've kind of like, you've violated some of the, the, the biggest rule is, you know, we're putting in this engineering control to try to get people who are the, the dirtiest part of the operation, shedding the most particulate. And here they are, they're just walking right through the barrier. Right. Like, okay. Well, that's okay. Let's, let's start there. We know we got, we got a problem there. So we, we need to look at how can we make this a real restrictive access barrier? Um, so initially they, they said, Hey, you know what, you know, we we got this covered. We really don't need any engineering support. And so they went and did the, got their, uh, acrylic panels, put them up and, uh, okay, well, good. We've improved the airflow. Um, but how do you, how do your operators do the operation now? The fill? Oh, well, they, 
they crouch down and kind of, and try not to fall as I go under the plastic barrier. <laughs> um, I, I, I think we missed the point here, guys. <sighs> yeah, now this is a little easier to clean. I will definitely give you that uh, than the curtains. And it is a real barrier, but when the operation and the SOP is now that the guys go underneath and gals go underneath. No, this is not improving the situation. This is not an engineering control that, that's, 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 that's improving the, uh, the, the, the risk to the product and increasing it. It's just strange. And, and this is one of the biggest problems that people face when we, when we talk about wraps is how to put barriers in that make sense and are well thought through that still allow the operations and mitigate the risk. So you'll see when you look at, if you look at the article, you know, these are some of these where uh, glove ports cost money or oops, we forgot the glove ports or people left out a section of the barrier by the, by the fill line where they knew they had issues simply because they needed to get in there and, and, and constantly maintain the machine. And they didn't, they couldn't quite think through how it was going to, how it was going to work if they had a restriction. So, so that's we, the, the, just real quick on that. So when you come into a situation like this, um, you know, somebody without even a background could uh, in this space could look at this and go, how do they expect this to uh, be effective, right? I mean, I could, I'm not, I don't do this. And I could look at that going, Hey, uh, the air can pretty much go wherever it wants. So like, how does that come to be okay ever in a, in a situation like this? Well, that's, that has to do more with the organizational culture and, uh, you know, their exposure to the rest of the industry and best practices. You know, if you're showing up at the same facility day in, day out for 20 years, you know, you kind of get into this mindset of, yeah, you know, we've done this before. It's good enough. We did it yesterday. Why isn't it good enough today? So when you, when you think about that, it's like, oh, you know, it's not these people are bad or that they, they just don't, they just don't know. They just don't see it. And when you have the ability to kind of have them step back and say, hey, this is, this is why we're doing things. This is how other people are handling it. You know, then they can they can start going through and understanding and learning. And so, as much fun as it is to to, to, to poke fun at these facilities and, and where they are, um, you know, sometimes we're, we're we're you know, people reading this are stuck in those situations. And you know, this is eye opening. It's like, wait a minute, I have been living this, and yeah, I did think there was something wrong with this. Oh, maybe I'm not alone. Maybe I do need to start trying to understand a little bit more. And, and, and push on, on, on management or, or, or operations or whoever to try to come up with a better solution that's going to reduce our risk. You know, I think, I, I, to just go back to what we started with, I think one of the things that's great about just the fact that you're writing articles and now you're doing a podcast to talk about all this, this is a, a much easier way to expose people that might not otherwise want to read a 500 page document on best practices to some ideas that are, you know, it's a little bit more bite sized you know, and uh, more of a story format instead of just, um, again, more of a textbook, I guess. Now I know we all sort of have to follow those things and they're important and that's our reference guide, but it's, it's just, it's just harder. And because you have these nice specific scenarios, it, it really helps. I, I did notice on your article, you were just talking about, um, curtains or barriers to 2017 you have the same one from 2010 it wasn't the same customer was it no no it, it was okay, good. It's, it's, a common, it's, a common, it's a common thing in, in, in the industry where we had those curtains for a long period of time and we just had difficulty getting past that and then uh, the other thing I like about the 2017 version of that is it highlights another important point is when we say ISO 5 or the, the the critical zone we're doing filling that's in operation so that we actually need to be validated that level of particulate and that microbial count while we're while we're in there doing the operations and so again when you start again it's one of those things if, if you're when we're talking with the operations people at this particular facility 
and the qualification like well of course we, we knew we could never meet iso 5 in operation because we're moving around too much there's too many particulates and like okay well if it if the idea is to reduce the risk and that we feel iso 5 in operation is the right level of risk does it make sense that we need to relook at these curtains slash you know plexiglass glass panels like yeah obviously it does because we know we'll never meet them and that's in, in endangering our patients like, okay mm -hmm. but it just took that little bit that to for them to rip for it to click and go oh no what we have been doing for the last 20 years was not the best practice it was not what we want to do so I, it's funny is that something that you come across uh i don't, I don't know if it's a lot or have you seen it typically where maybe there's that this is what this is the way it's set up it's perfect it's running don't touch you know it meets all the requirements and then they realize oh yeah this isn't how we'd be using it though so like that example yeah there's actually supposed to be somebody in there doing this when it's being yeah. classified do you see that happen a lot yeah a lot that's that's and that and th those and those and those sort of things are where, why we, we we write these these articles? We kind of bring some of those project experiences in, um, you know, because it catches people. You know, it's something you know cute, whether it's you know, like this one or whether it's cats in the warehouse or or one of the other ones that have the, the catchy the catchy title. It's where it gets people to, to click on it, and then they they read through it and they're like, oh, you know what? I actually need to think about how this how this applies in my plan because. It really comes down to just thinking through all these these operational challenges that happen. You know, it's great when we sit back and we design, we engineer solutions, but watching how things actually get done, it's like, oh, rats! That's not what I was thinking was going to happen. Right. Yeah. It's I, I I remember hearing a story when I first I, I so I came into the industry in like 2012. I remember hearing a story about a facility, and I don't even know where this facility is, but where they were, they were, they were having some issues with, I believe it was like, like bacteria counts in the air or something in one of these spaces. And they couldn't figure out where it was coming from. They were changing gowning procedures and all stuff to make sure it was down. And they, they continued to have them every once in a while. And they long and short of it is there was a security guard on night shift that had a dog with him that was bringing him through this that space at night when nobody was around and that was actually where it was coming from and uh you know they had no idea because there was nothing happening bad during the day uh thought that oh, was yeah fun. well i i I've, went, I've got a bunch of those scenarios that, oh, that are great they're real good <laughs> oh, there's, there's, <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah the, well okay so for, first off have, having had followed things through night shift in in production facilities I, I would like to start off before bashing night shift and saying they have a really tough job. You are completely out of sync with the rest of the world and your brain does not work right anymore. <laughs> now with, with that said, you, we've, you know, another, another really good story is, uh, you know, there was a, a facility where, uh, you know, QA wanted to do, uh, uh, the plate monitoring on the personnel who were doing the aseptic fill. So that's where they, they come in, they're going to say, Hey, you, 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 did you gown right? Can you come here to do the touch plates and check to see that you didn't get any contamination on your hands um, that would potentially make it into the product. And so this QA person was, was standing outside the, the gowning room waiting for these people to come out uh, on their break uh, on the night shift. And they never came out. They stayed in there the entire shift. And she, and she said, what's, what's wrong? How, how does this, how did, they, how did that work? Was there another entrance, something I didn't know about? And what it was, was they had just brought their lunches in with them. And, <laughs> and they were just sitting there in the gowning room eating lunch, taking their break. And nobody had any idea because man, that shift was just doing their thing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah, that would be a, yeah, so that would be a big one. Somebody's sitting there eating a bologna sandwich <laughs> yeah, in, their, in the clean room. 
They're getting they're getting counts and types of bacteria that didn't even know should exist in a place like that, probably. Um, oh yeah, well, and you know, we we talked about it. You know, isolators at the very beginning and how great and they are great, but you know, there's still some procedures and maintenance and things that you need to be account, account for and, and good design practices. And um, but sometimes you just can't stop stupid. Um, yeah. <laughs> you had a there was a there was a facility that had a problem with uh, cheese mold in an isolator. Well, nobody, they, they didn't do a very good des design of, of, of how, this is, how, how things dock to it. And their gowning procedures a little lax in coming out of the cafeteria. So the guy, there was, you know, they trace it back to a couple of operators who go eat lunch and somehow contaminate the, uh, the transfer, the material going in. And they, Air the cheese mold into the isolator. Every that bologna time. and cheese sandwich every day for lunch, huh? That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, hey, um, so you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna want to just point everybody to to read your article because I think it was a good one, and you you know, there's way more case studies here than we've talked about today. But um, you have two sections at the end. You have one lessons learned and one conclusion. So let's can we just chat about those real quick? So some of the lessons learned um, that you know you're just you're pretty sold on. Let's just talk about a couple of them that that really stick out to you. Okay, so the the best application for RABS is is retrofits. Um, now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean you just go okay. I'm going to put plastic around it and it's retrofitted. You you need to think through it. You need to really design it and you should consider hiring somebody who has an expertise in that because a lot of these articles, you know, actually all of these in this one were people that just design stuff on their own, whether it was operational or maintenance or, or, or the staff engineering at, at a particular facility. Um, but there are people who do this for a living. That's all they do year in year out is, is make grabs and isolators and they can give you the best practices and give you a, a system that's well thought through. So when you don't do that, you wind up with something that's pretty much junk. You know, either your the operators are bypassing the barrier, or you've put in something that's even worse in terms of its ability to uh, to protect the product. Yeah, that's that's, that's, big that's a that's a big one, and I've I've had multiple conversations now doing this, and I've heard similar things where the, the biggest mistakes people come across is because, and it's you know I, I think we all run into this in our daily lives too. I'm you know I'm sure you've done some project at home on your own that you're like oh I can do this, and that was a mistake, right? I got multiple yep. in my house right now. <laughs> um, but the, you know the, this the significance of this kind of work and. Um, the, the ultimate risk of doing it wrong is a lot more substantial than whether I tiled my bathroom well, right? So um, it's, it is, it's important to realize that there are people like you or others that this is what they do every day. They're extremely good at it and they can navigate you through a lot of the big pitfalls of doing this well. Exactly. And, and, you know, as, as you think about it and plan it out, you, you have to keep in mind for, um, you know, an aseptic fill finish facility, you need to continuously reinvest in the facility uh, in order to stay, you know, current with the GMP. So they always talk about sometimes that little C, A little in, C. Uh, in front of GMP, you know, current. So you, you re, you're going to have to reinvest. Let's, you know, let's do it wisely. Get, get the right people to do the right thing. Yeah. Um. So uh, you, you have one other one here about, um, and I think I just want to reiterate this, all these were accommodating an existing line. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's, I think that's a reiteration of some of that, but that seems to be where the big issues happen. How I, you know, and I just, again, I'm out of my depth. How much of, how many times is this done, like new construction right from the get-go, or is it more going to isolators now? Yeah, it's, the new construction for RABS has significantly slowed down. Uh, they're less than 50% of the new lines now. Um, you know, a, a few years ago, the majority of lines were still getting RABS, even for new. 
um, though they were more on the, the closed wraps type of design active systems. <laughs> Today, what we're looking at in terms of um, regulatory acceptance and cost differentiation uh, difference, it, it's really just driving people to isolators. It doesn't, for a new line. If you're trying to retrofit something that's old, it can be a real pain to try to work through all the nuances of how's the, how you're gonna how you're gonna construct the isolator in place, how you're gonna retrofit this line, which you may or may not have good drawings on, or there may be modifications to, or it's you know to, in a CMO where we're we're doing a whole lot of different commodities that I need to constantly pull off tracks and change out wheels and do things and, and, and pull a line apart, which is really hard to do in an isolator environment. Mm. All right, awesome. So, okay, the, the last section you have on here is, <clears throat> is your conclusion section. Um, and there's, there's, there's a lot of them here. So, you know, um, what do you think sticks out to you as maybe the biggest, you know, takeaway from all of this? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing all this to reduce the risk to patient. Um, we've, so if we've, if we're coming from a retro, you know, we're looking at a retrofitable line, ah, it's been fine, we've been doing this for the last 15 years, nobody's died that you can prove. I've actually had somebody in quality state it that way, that you can prove, uh, which was a very interesting way of putting it. <clears throat> uh, so what's driving it? it? It has to do with the evolving regulations. We're trying to reduce that risk. The regulations are, are, are pushing for tighter and, and tighter control. We need to be familiar with the regulations. We need to understand, you know, again, that's why I like that particular example, because when all the operations staff, including, including the management, had one, ex, you know, one understanding of what ISO 5 meant, but that wasn't what was actually in the regulations and the guidance. So in addition to um, you know, the facility itself having issues and having uh, contaminated units go out, when the FDA came in and their management said, oh, it's qualified to this, and they looked at the validation report and realized it wasn't for the F in the FDA's eyes, the FDA um, you know, cited them for that. So there is there is danger in not knowing and not being current. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Your last point that you put is when in doubt, read the EU GMP Annex One. So, yeah, right. <laughs> Make sure yeah, you know yeah, that one. It, 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 that's 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 if you if you have a lot of questions, take a look there. It, it's a good place. It's um. If you get into into the the, the, the circle of, of the real aseptic technology experts, they do have some issues with Annex One and, and the way things are, are are stated. But for a good chunk of the industry who are, are looking for more of that cookbook type thing, it does go. It does have a little bit more cookbook. Thou shall do this. Thou shall do that. Here's a gowning procedure. How we expect you to, to gown. Whereas the FDA is more is generally more risk based in their mm -hmm. guidance and in, in what's an actual regulation. Right. Um, all right. Well, that was great. Um, so I got a couple more, two more questions for you before we yep. finish up here. So um, everybody I've had on so far, um, I'm asking the same question, and you know I'm interested in hearing hearing what you have uh, to say about this. The question is. What would you tell yourself if you could go back 10 years? Um, what would you tell yourself professionally with regards to engineering, with regards to you know, how you deal with customers? It doesn't really matter, but I, you know, keep it on the professional level. What would you tell yourself 10 years ago if you could go back? Um, you know, for me, it's, it's kind of a difficult question because 10 years ago, I, I had the, uh, the older Mr. Bosenhart whispering in my ear, you know, telling me in 10 years, you're going to want to know this in your, as you progress in your career, you're going to want to keep this in mind, keep this in mind. I know it doesn't seem like this is a good idea now, or you really should do this. So I've always had that, that really strong, you know, he's 
both a father and uh, also a, a great mentor in the, in the business. So it's a little hard for me to think about, oh man, what would I wish I have known? Because I, I had somebody whisper in my ear all, the whole time. Um, Maybe you know, that you should have listened to him. <laughs> well, I, I guess to, to a large extent, I did listen to him. That's why that's we're great. still, that's why we're still, that's why we're still working together on articles and podcasts and we haven't killed each other. Yeah. That, that happens too with, with father son teams is uh, they, uh, they, they call it quits pretty quick if they don't see eye to eye. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's it, the, the, the biggest takeaways I always have is, is just think, think, always think long-term, you know, and, um, the biggest one for young professionals, emerging professionals, is to keep in mind that you are in control of your own career. Uh, as, as much as we, we want to see <clears throat> organizations come up with a plan, a development plan for us, how are we going to advance? What are we going to do next? There's only one person who has your best interests in mind and is going to drive it. That's you. Mm. Amen. So that's probably the, the biggest lesson that I got out of all that, all yeah. the whispering in my ear. That's good. Yeah, it is kind of funny. Uh, you are the first person I've asked that actually had like an older version of yourself whispering in your ear the whole time. So that's a, that's a unique one. Um, it, it is. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's pretty great. Um, okay. And so just to, just to finish off, thank you so much for doing this. If, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, talk to you, read your stuff because you got i'm you know i searched this article and it shows up on five different um websites so what would be the best way to get a hold of you or, or see the other things that you've been writing over the years um so the the biggest chunk of articles that i have out there is on bioprocessonline.com um that website also hosts my podcast that i'm doing with my father uh, biotech with the bows and hearts uh, in addition, I am pretty active in ISP, so you'll probably see me at uh, the annual meeting or uh, some of the other up upcoming events. You can also reach out to me um, via email at uh, my work email, ebosenhart at ipsdb.com. All right, awesome. Yeah, and I, you know, I found you on on LinkedIn. I saw your, your podcast, too. and I found you on LinkedIn. So, um, yeah, and you were very responsive. I appreciate that. So anyways, Eric, it was great to have you on today. Thank you so much. Um, you said you were really big into, you know, fixing things. It looks like you're missing a tire. I just, just want to make sure you're aware of that. It's right back. Yeah, you. no, no the, the, uh, Amazon dropped it off uh, last night. I need to put the tire back on for my, my ride tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah, today, today, today was a run day. Tomorrow's a, a bike day. Oh, more power to you. Mine's a sitting day. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being on and uh, I look forward to, to talking to you again sometime. All right. Thanks again for listening to the Modern Biopharma podcast. Please reach out if there is someone you'd like us to interview or a topic you'd like us to discuss. We will make it happen. And don't forget to like us on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. It helps us get the word out. See you next time.